In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Christ is in our midst. I remember watching some of the Olympics in the past and also some sporting events where someone is so far ahead in whatever that competition is that they start to get cocky and they start to slow down. And I think if I believe, if I remember correctly, it was Michael Phelps who thought he had won and thought the wall was right there and reached and he failed to take that last stroke and he actually did not get first place because he failed to take that one last stroke. And sometimes when we see, <clears throat> when we're doing the right things, that we can put ourselves on a pedestal and say, well, I'm doing all the right things. And then in that comes the sense of pride and also, as the fathers of the church say, when great pride comes right before a great fall. And we see that in sporting events, many times you'll, you'll see that a team is so far ahead that they start to go easy and they start to, uh, as they would say, hot dog it and, and do different tricks and things and then they start to lose their lead. And I, I believe too that there's also a story about a, a, a rabbit and a turtle that captures that pretty correctly too, saying that the, the rabbit, knowing that he had pure speed, slows down and it's the turtle with that perseverance and that slow drive to continue on that actually wins the race. And today in the gospel reading, we hear about this rich man who is a tax collector, who no one really liked, and we hear about a Pharisee who was the, the group of people who knew the letter of the law perfectly uh, from the Old Testament. They knew everything, they did everything correctly. But they come into the temple to pray, they come into the church, and the, the Pharisee is standing, and there's a little nuance in the writing that says, as he was praying with himself. That's an interesting phrase, is the Pharisee was up and he prayed thus with himself. In, order, in, in other words, he spoke to himself. I do all these things right. I, I fast, I give, I tithe, which means he was giving 10% of everything that he got. He did all these things that were required, but he prayed with himself. He didn't pray to God, and he also put himself on a pedestal saying, I'm doing all the right things, therefore I should be better than everyone else. And I think even in secular society today, we see that. I, I went to school, I did this, I, I worked hard. Why isn't everything coming my way? Is something that I hear people say. I'm doing all the right things, but things aren't turning out the way that I want them to. But back to the, the Pharisee, he's in the church. He's actually doing the right thing. He's in the church praying, which is what we're supposed to do. But how he was praying was significantly different than the tax collector who was in the back of the church, not, at, not even wanting to be noticed by God, but keeping his head down, just saying, God, that was the first thing that he says. He says, God, have mercy upon me. So he speaks to God. And Christ references, the tax collector says, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like others around me, that I'm not like even the tax collector over there, praying with himself. And then we have the tax collector in the back saying, I can't even look up to heaven because I'm such a mess. As we are here today in the church, and as many of you struggle to fast, struggle to pray, struggle to give, struggle to do good works, struggle to be stewards, struggle to, to learn about God. This is the time when we have the triodion period, which starts today, the pre-Lenten period, where we're called to, to really shake ourselves and say, what am I doing and why? How am I really praying? Am I really praying to God or am I praying to myself? Am I patting myself on the back? Am I in expectation of my own works to pay off for me? Or am I in hum, humble, bowed down posture before God, asking God to do his great works in me? And that greatest work being that of forgiveness. We see many times in, in Christianity and in, in different denominations and even in the Orthodox Church, sometimes when people decide that 
they're doing all the right things, and now they're going to judge everybody else around you. In fact, um, it's interesting, as a priest, how many times people will come up and say, Father, you're not doing the baptism right. The child has to face the other way. You have to put them all the way down in the water or with the Stefana, you have to grab the Stefana this way and this way. And Father, you know, uh, uh, George and, and, you know, Crete or whatever says, no, you got to go like this and then like that and then like this and then like that and like this and then back and then back. And I hear this and I'm like, okay, just take it easy. In fact, even in the liturgy, some people will say, well, how come you face this way and how come you stand out here and all these things? Because we are trying to do the right thing, sometimes we lose perspective of what we're actually doing. We lose perspective of the, the idea behind what we're doing. And what's the idea behind what we're doing in, in the church? Why are we here? We're here for God's mercy. We're not here to, for, as a fashion show. We're not here as people to come and pat ourselves on the back or say, Lord, I thank you, and this is the seal of my week because I did all these great things, and now I'm coming to show off to you, God. We come here because we're all broken, everybody, from the highest of clergy, from the patriarch down to the, the person who's studying about orthodoxy. We're all broken, in between. Everywhere, everybody's got problems. We all have things that hold us back, so we come to God to be released from those things that drag us down, to grab onto God, to be lifted up as Adam and Eve were lifted up out of the grave. But we have to remember why we're doing what we're doing is because we are asking God for his mercy. Not coming to church to have a seal of, of certification of what we're doing. And also to remember that in the church, you're going to see people do different things. You might see somebody come up to an icon and bow all the way down and go all the way down like this. You might see somebody do a full prostration, which I'm not going to do right now, where you go down on your knees, you go down, you put your head on the ground, you come back up and, and do your cross. I've seen some people do those things, uh, those different actions as they venerate an icon or even as they come up to the priest or whatever to receive the blessing. And some people will say, look at them. They're, they're, they're being pious. But what separates us when we say something like that from the Pharisee who said, I, thank God I'm not like that tax collector over there. So it goes both ways. It goes both ways when we judge other people for doing the right thing and we judge other people for doing the wrong thing. And what is it at the base is our disposition when we approach God. Are we worthy, any of us, to say that person is a fake Right? That person is faking it. They're up there, they're trying to do their thing, and they're trying to fake it. Or that person is a wretch, and I can't even believe that they went up for communion with a potty mouth like they have. And, all the, and we, we can go one way, we can go the other way. But what, we're, what we learn today in the gospel reading is, what do you, all right, I want everybody, we're going to do a little experiment. I want everybody to look down at your shoes. Don't look up. Everybody look down at your shoes. No cheating. And for those who are asleep, you're already, are already there. Look down, you're looking up. I see you looking up at me. If you look up at me, you're going to hold bread at the end of the church. How many fingers do I got up? Three. No, I have one. And you know why you didn't know that? Now you can look up. It's because you were looking down. Now look down one more time. What is the person in front of you wearing? Uh, see, I saw some of you cheat and you looked up. All right, now you can look up. Yellow. There you go. Because it's the robes. Of course you know that. The altar boys are, have an edge. The point is, if you're focused down in your heart, as the, the hesychas, isichia is quiet in Greek, the hesychas were people um, who focused in prayer and they looked down into their heart. And they would sit in a certain position where they would focus and look down. Now, I've said this before, years and years through being here, that when you listen to the gospel reading, you should not be following along in the bulletin trying to figure out if the translation is different. And say, oh, Father said this, and he didn't say that. Hmm. And the worst is during Holy Week, right? Because we all have different translations. You have, the, you have the thick black book, I have a red book. Then you have a different black book that's a different translation. Then you have King James and the these and the thous and the yous and the he's and the she's. 
And then everybody's reading and they're like, oh, I didn't. and then I say, what was it about? And they're like, I don't know, but you said he and she and it has thee and thou in here. Is that legit? I mean, did you actually read the right story or whatever? And we miss it because we're focused on what's around us and what's happening. Instead of just saying, let me listen. Let me just focus and listen and let the gospel hit my heart and go in my heart. That would be like if every time you listen to music on the radio, you grabbed an instrument and you played along with it. And you said, well, i got to play along with this. And, oh, wait, oh, that's a different key, and i got a tune, and, and we, we went that way. Why can't we just listen and appreciate music? Well, we do. The same thing with the gospel. Let it sink in us. But if we're focused as the hesychast, inside, internal, looking down, looking in, then we don't focus on what's going around us. We don't focus on what somebody else is wearing or a, a, a gesture, a posture, clothing, a noise, uh, a sound, whatever that's going on. We have the blinders on. And I'm not saying that we should be individuals in church and not pay attention to anybody, but there comes time when we have to grab on to the moment where we come before God in our simplest, basic nature. And we come before God and say, Lord, I have problems. I don't feel well. I'm depressed. I'm sad. I'm lonely. I'm grieving. I need a better job. My marriage is in trouble. My kids are having problems. My, my life is just, it's, I need help. And that is not that conversation that we all will have, and if you haven't had it already, you will at some point, something. That conversation is between you and God. And in that, saying whatever it is that we're broken with, there is no room in there to say that we're better than somebody else. No room at all. You can't say, well, Lord, you know, uh, and I think sometimes people try and do that. They, they say, well, you know, I have this particular disease, but at least it's not as bad as that person over there. Well, it is bad. I mean, you have a, a disease. We can't equate everything to other people and draw what the world has. Because yes, you might say, I have a terrible job and I'm not making enough money. But then those same people underestimate that request to God to say, help me, by saying, well, you know, there's people in other countries that don't have anything. And I think it's a good barometer to figure out what reality is in our request to God. But it doesn't undermine and, and dissipate our own problems. We have to ask God for the help in our brokenness. And we have to understand, too, that we do that not by our own efforts of anything we've done to make a difference, but we do ask God for things and help and guidance and forgiveness and, and healing and every good thing out of God's mercy. That's why in the service, what do we say? If, if I said, in peace let us pray to the Lord, what's the response? Lord have mercy. How many times do you hear Lord have mercy? In, in the liturgy. In fact, sometimes we hear it, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, right? Father, give the blessing, which is at the end of the service. Before every prayer that the pre priest reads, it's Lord have mercy. After every petition that's said, just about, it's Lord have mercy. Why? Because the mercy of God is what we ask for as that tax collector bowed his head and said, Lord, have mercy upon me. And even if you don't know what to ask for, you don't have a good grasp on what's going on in your life. You say, I don't know, something's off, but I don't know quite what it is, and I don't know how to change it, and I, I, but I feel wrong. I, something feels off in my life. Then do as the fathers and the saints of the church have done over and over. And what is that? The Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me, the sinner. If you don't say any other prayer, and if you don't know what to pray for, you don't know what to ask for, you don't know where your life is going, say that prayer. And instead of having a prayer rope around your wrist as jewelry, pull it off and use it. And all those knots are, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me, the sinner. Lord Jesus Christ. And in Greek, it's Kyrie Isu Christe eleison. That's the prayer that will continue to guide you. And that is really the prayer of the tax collector today. Not to say how good we are, but to ask for God's mercy. May God have mercy upon us always, and may we always say, 
Lord have mercy. Amen.